everybody. Uh, welcome to the third episode in our series, The Stories Women Carry. Uh, today, I'm very, very excited to have Asimwe de Burakawe with us um, as our uh, panelist. Uh, we kind of shift focus from Kenya and our Kenyan panelists and move to Uganda to talk a little bit about the cultural sector and creative practice in Uganda. Um, this is a special edition with, because it's a recorded session today. And so uh, we happen to be recording it on Diwali. So happy Diwali to all of our viewers, everybody that's watching. Um, thank you all for tuning in. And of course, uh, we, you know, we still are offering um, American and Kenyan sign language interpretation that is happening live for this session. So a special thanks to our KSL and our ASL interpreters for being here with us today, uh, offering us this interpretation. Um, and of course, to the Nairobi Musical Theatre Initiative, to Tebere Arts Foundation, and to the HowlRun Theatre Commons for being co-producers on this series. Um, for those of you that are tuning in for the first time today, my name is Karishma Bagani. I'm a director, producer, dramaturg, scholar, and the official question asker of this series. Um, I want to take this moment to introduce our panelists once again. I, I just, you know, it's, I say, I feel like I sound like a broken record every week because I say the same thing, but these women that are present to, with us on these series are just so difficult to have a concise introduction for any of them. Um, because they're all just so powerful and wonderful. And um, so Asimwe is, is part of this group. She's, she's a playwright. Um, I think I'll, instead, of, instead of introducing all the multiple awards and all the multiple plays and the multiple residencies and productions you've gotten, I'll let you do that, Asimwe. Um, I'll start off by sharing how that we met two years ago, so, which has felt like, I think, five or six years that I've known you for ages. But... It's only been two years since we've known each other. Um, and I, I, I stumbled upon this connection through Catherine Corey and met Asimwe while I was doing some research in Uganda a few summers ago. So, um, hi Asimwe. Hi Karishma. How's it going? Good, thank you. How are you? Good, thank you so much for being on this panel today with me. Thank you so much for having me. It's such an honor. Thank you. I mean, as looking at the list of the women you're having these conversations with, and I, I really felt so blessed and lucky to have been included among them. So thank you so much for having me. Asimwe, you are a powerhouse. You are wonderful. And thank you so much for, for being willing to share your story with us today and, and, and talk to us for, for a few minutes. Um, why don't you start off, because as I said earlier, it's not going to be possible for me to, to read an entire bio and do justice to who Asimwe is. So tell us, tell us who Asimwe is. I always like, this is like my story time. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, again, thank you so much for having me. And uh, I want to, first of all, uh, I, I think start by apologizing. It's raining in Kampala right now. And my internet is a little unstable. So if you see me frozen or you can't hear me all right, please bear with me. Uh, but I, I am crossing my fingers that it will hold it together until the end of this interview. Thank you. Okay, so <laughs> also, <laughs> thank you. Also, just thought I would jump in there and mention that uh, we might have a little cameo appearance by a little somebody uh, later on. Asimwe has, has been off... Um, work not really because Asimwe is always working but she's been off work officially because she just had a baby so congratulations thank you so much yes he might make an appearance on the screen i don't know depending on how much of me he will need during the course of this interview <laughs> uh, so let me introduce myself uh, my name is Asimwe deborah kawe i am um, from Uganda, was born and raised in rural Uganda in a place called Chiruhura. A few years ago, you would never be able to find that place on Google Maps, <laughs> but I think now it's there. <laughs> and that has nothing to do with me. Uh, so I was born and raised in, in Uganda. I got my education here uh, until until uh, 2006 when I left for the United States to do an MFA in writing for performance at the California Institute of the Arts. 
I, um, I studied theater and performing for my undergrad at Makere University. And I am a playwright, uh, or I write things that people are so gracious to call plays. <laughs> so I guess that's how I come to define myself as a playwright. I uh, am also a producer. I produce theater, I produce uh, an international theater festival called the Kampala International Theater Festival that is annual and happens in Kampala. I also sometimes define myself as a performer, but I haven't performed in a long time, so I don't know whether I still qualify to call myself a performer, but I do that as well. And, um, and once in a while I direct for stage I don't enjoy directing very much, uh, but I do direct. And I enjoy the process uh, of directing, but I always feel like, mm, that's probably not my calling. <laughs> uh, but I do direct as well. Uh, I don't know what else I may have forgotten. I guess that kind of sums up of who I am. And I am a mother of a, a nine months old baby who is my joy and light. Uh, uh, yeah, and I live in Kampala, Uganda. Thanks, Asimwe. Thank you for that. I have so many questions to start off with just because I always have questions for you, even when we're talking, when we're not in an interview context. Um, but uh, tell me a little bit about your journey academically. You mentioned that you started off uh, studying theater and the performing arts at Makerere, and then moved to California Institute of the Arts to pursue your MFA. Um, what was the difference in education like? Um, tell us a bit more about that, yes. that journey. Sorry, repeat the question. At some point I lost you, sorry. Uh, no, it's okay, it's okay. Uh, tell us a little bit more about the journey of studying performing arts at both Makerere and Cal Arts. What were the similarities, the differences? Um, yeah, how did the context change the way you approached performing arts? Okay, so at Makere University, I was actually there for five years. Like who does that, performing arts for five years? Uh, so I start, started at Makere University with a diploma in music, dance and drama. And the course was kind of combined, like you couldn't specialize to just do music or just do dance or do drama. It was like an, a holistic kind of course. Um, and and uh, actually, let me rephrase that. Students could select one discipline and specialize in it, but we were required to still like uh, study the other two disciplines. So for example, I specialized in drama, but I still had to do everything that those who are specializing in music did and those who are specializing in dance did. Uh, so it was holistic like that. And so I studied that for two years. And then because I wanted to get more of the drama component, I went back to Makare for three years uh, to do a bachelor's degree. And I was specifically studying drama. Um, now, when, when I was doing the diploma course, it was very, very practical. Um, most of the things we're doing were like with our bodies, were very, very practical. And, and then for the degree, for the uh, bachelor's degree, it was more theoretical, more academic. Um, and so it was, I actually feel like, um, that it was so great in the sense that I was able to get the world of both, that I was able to get uh, a component that was heavily practical and a component that was academic. Uh, and so when I uh, graduated uh, after the three year course, the bachelor's course, I went to do an MFA at Cal Arts. And this time I, I knew that I, I wanted to, to focus on writing for live performance. Uh, and so I studied uh, an MFA in writing for performance. And again, it was all about writing. Whereas, for example, when I was at Makere, yes, we did write scripts for stage, but it was, like I mentioned, it was more of how do you write a play as opposed to actually writing 
the play. Uh, and so at Cal Arts, uh, it, was, it, it is a conservatory uh, uh, kind of program. And so I got to really uh, spend time, three years of my time, doing nothing but write. And because the, the way the school was structured at that point, at that time, we could, as playwrights, we could work with actors, we could work with directors, um, and the school has other arts uh, disciplines and arts, arts genres. So there's visual arts, there's uh, animation, there's photography, there's music. So, so we, could, we were encouraged to, to collaborate with, with uh, students from the other departments uh, that I have mentioned. So that was so cool in the sense that it allowed for us students to think broadly, that theater cannot be confined on stage, that we could, so I remember like my uh, final thesis, I was collaborating with a musician from the music school, I was collaborating with, um, with uh, students who are doing videography, uh, because it was a multimedia performance. Uh, so I got this opportunity to dream beyond my wildest dreams, to see, to imagine a performance that could have all these disciplines together. And I think that was something that, interestingly, that was something that made me kind of access um, my artistic sensibilities from my childhood. I will, I hope I can get some uh, a moment to talk about that. Uh, because I was introduced into the arts and performance from earlier on as a child, I lived with my grandmother. And, and so for me, performing was not just one discipline, it was everything. And so being at Cal Arts and being able to access students who were doing all these things and being able to incorporate them into my thesis was such a joy. Uh, and I felt like it was in many ways um, allowing me to, to access my childhood voice mm -hmm. uh, and performance and ways of performing that I was introduced to as a child. Mm. I think we're, that's so, thank you for sharing that, you know, because I think it, it really speaks to the kind of work that you create now as an artist and a playwright. Um, but just as you've said, I'd love to hear a little bit more about your introduction to the performing arts. Um, what was the first time you accessed storytelling as a, a part of your life? Um, so, uh, so like I mentioned, I was born and raised in rural Uganda. And when I was nine years old, I lived with my grandmother, my maternal grandmother. And my maternal grandmother always told stories, always. Uh, folk tales, fairy tales. And I remember like us as children and my siblings, my cousins used to converge in her house and she would tell us stories. And the tradition in her house was that in the subsequent nights would have to retell those stories and and of course it was not just like telling stories they had a component of performing they had song they had you know she would really like perform these stories and so so that for me in retelling the stories it was my introduction into performance and, and into storytelling and the primary school that I went to, which was very close to my grandmother's home, uh, also had a storytelling class. I'm not sure whether primary schools still have that, but I, we used to have storytelling classes where each pupil would be required to stand in front of the class and tell a story. It could be a folk tale, it could be a fairy tale, it could be anything. Um, and then kind of find ways to involve the rest of the class, like through song or, or call and response. So I really believe that uh, my introduction into storytelling, to performance, was in my grandmother's house. Um, and like I mentioned, because it was not just like 
her telling the story. It was the, all of us because she would require for us to sing alongside her. She would teach mm-hmm. us the songs in the story and then would sing with her. It, you know, like the stories from my culture have a call and response kind of thing. So then she would call out, would respond. Um, and so I, I really do believe that that was my, um, my, my first school into storytelling and performance. I just love hearing you talk about your childhood in that way because it makes me, reminds me of my own. Um, my introduction to storytelling was also through my grandma and she would you know, tell all of these really interesting folk tales and myths and the journey of what it meant for, you know, uh, five generations ago for us to have moved from the Indian subcontinent to Africa and how that has changed the way we understand our, our values in our culture, you know, as, as, as fifth generation Africans of, of Indian descent. It's, it's really fascinating that, that the medium of introduction of these stories across all cultures is so similar, regardless of where yeah. you are, you know, whether it's Kenya or Uganda, whether you're from India or not, or, you know, um, so that's very fascinating to hear. Uh, yeah. I see, how does that, if at all, translate into, or does that translate into your practice as a producer and a playwright today? Wow, that's a, a very important question, actually. I, you know, for the longest time, I didn't realize that the kind of impact that my grandmother's stories um, had on me. And I should also mention that, um, so there's a term in my culture, uh, which is called Oktarama. And it means people gathering and telling stories, sharing riddles, and so doing all of these things that are very rooted into African folklore. Um, And I'm mentioning that because those actually do make their way into my writing. So it's not just like telling a story. It's it's all of these things that that, um, make African folklore so rich. Uh, so uh, for the longest time, I didn't realize that these things do make their way into my writing until I figured that I think I, like it, it kind of dawned on me that all of my plays have song. It's, it's like an element that I subconsciously use. Um, and I, I was asking myself, wait a minute, where does this come from? And then I noticed, oh, it actually does come from um the storytelling tradition that that i uh i was born and raised on and and then i the other thing that kind of you know comes into my writing is uh a folk tales so like i think about some of my plays and they are like the basis of them is actually a folk tale i use them as a jumping off point into into telling the kind of story that I want to tell. So, and this is something that I, I did not like sit down and say, oh, I'm just going to like borrow from the things that I was introduced to as a child and bring them into my world. It's something that just happened organically. Um, Can you give us an example of one of your plays um, and how that process went? Just sorry to interrupt you, but just so folks are able to access oh, it. That's okay. <laughs> okay. Um, Hmm. Okay, I guess let me talk about cooking oil. Uh, so cooking oil is a story that's uh, about this 18 year old who is uh, selling cooking oil that is supposed to, to be for her village uh, as, as aid. And, and, but she's selling it to get school fees. And then the, there's also a politician who is, uh, okay. I'm sorry, I'm going to pause a bit. Is that okay? Yes, please, please. Go ahead. Okay. Okay. Great. Um, Quick commercial break, that was. Uh, So essentially, just to bring our viewers back, what I was asking you about is giving an example of one of your plays and how one of these folklores kind of informed the way you were writing, just so we could get a better idea. Right, yes. And I, I was beginning to talk about cooking oil. So Cooking Oil is a play that's uh, about an 18-year-old who is selling cooking oil that is supposed to be aid for her starving village. And, and there's also a politician who is also selling cooking oil that he just wants to 
run for presidency. So he's just accumulating a lot of money to run for, uh, for um, presidency of, of his country. And, but this girl is keeping money for her school fees now. Uh, so when I was putting the story together, the thing that was so strong on my mind was how much this 18 year old must have like planned and maybe cried in the night, crying herself to sleep because of the fact that um, she cannot go to school and her siblings are going to school and she's the firstborn. Uh, but they, her parents have told her to hold on until her, her brothers have reached fine school and then maybe she can also go back to school. And I'm, I'm thinking sh this must be devastating for her. So what probably helps her go back to, to sleep? And I was thinking probably an alibi get her to, to go back. Like she probably sings to herself a lullaby. And so then I, I began to research about different lullabies in, uh, in different cultures across Uganda. And I came across this beautiful lullaby from, um, from the Busoga region. Busoga is in, eastern, in, in the eastern part of Uganda. And it's really beautiful. And, and I was like, this is, this is the lullaby. And the lullaby is, is like saying, sleep, sleep, my baby. No, my baby's hungry because she does not have something to eat. My baby is hungry because she does not have something to eat. Um, and I was like, yeah, yeah, this is, this is the lullaby that she probably sings to herself to be able to, to go to sleep. Uh, mm. after crying her heart out in the night because she can't go to school and because her parents have told her don't go to school. So then that became a jumping off point uh, for, the, for me to, to write the play. And actually the play starts with, with, uh, with the lullaby. Mm. Um, uh, yeah, so that's, that's an example, I guess, that I can give. Um, and then uh, for maybe I could also talk a little bit about about appointment with God. Mm -hmm. uh, so appointment with God has many, many songs in it. Uh, some are hymns, because I was, I was raised in the church. Um, and so now also that part of me, and I, I always felt like church was a storytelling space. Uh, and the songs and, and the priests, you know, like reading from, from the Bible or, or the preacher taking the pulpit, it always felt like it was a, a performance space. And then the singing, the standing, the sitting down, all the rituals that, uh, that take place in church. Um, so, so anyway, Appointment with God has some hymns and has, um, has some, some songs, like songs that we always sang as we, we played games as kids. Um, and, and so, and, and I used those two because of the core dynamics that are at play in that play. Um, and yeah, so I, I will just shut up. But yeah, those are the two examples that I can give. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Thank you so much, Asimwe. Um, this is very helpful because I think, I mean, folks who are watching us should possibly try and find ways to watch trailers or watch or read synopses of both cooking a, an appointment with God. Cause I think they're such distinctly different stories set in different spaces um, uh, that both use similar techniques, right? Both use folkloric backgrounds, both use traditional elements to then tell this very contemporary story about a specific experience that we have as Africans or an experience that we have in the rural world versus in the urban world, uh, you know, in the, as immigrants to a different country. Um, I had the pleasure of being, of assisting one of the readings of Appointment with God with Sahim in February as part of Playwrights Realm Festival. So um, that was very exciting to see how the piece kind of came to life and has grown beyond, beyond that moment because it's changed so much since, since that time as well. So, yeah. Yeah, it has. Uh, it has. And, uh, and I, think, I think what was really, I'm so glad that you mentioned that. I think what was very helpful in that uh, workshop and, the, and eventually um, the staged uh, reading of it at the festival 
was working with a director who totally understands yeah. the landscape within which the play lives and was so gracious to translating the, the different elements at play in, 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 in the script to the actors that, that, you know, you know, some of them do have the kind of, you know, migrating from one place to another, facing um, uh, uh, visa consular officers, uh, but the majority of the actors actually did not have that kind of experience. So Sahim was really amazing. So having you and Sahim in the room who, you know, like kind of uh, have experienced the kind of things that I talk <laughs> about in the play <laughs> was really, really helpful. And, and also the kind of questions that, uh, that you guys were asking to kind of help me to understand understand the kind of story that I'm trying to tell vis-a-vis -vis the story that I think I have told in the paper. Mm -hmm. I want to shift focus a little bit into talking about the work that you produce, but before then, I, I want to ask a question about um, audiences and how your work is, is interpreted and received in the various contexts that you've presented and shared worked in, work in. So how was it, how, Red Hills, for example, another, another play that you, work, that you wrote, um, how was, what is the difference in how it is received in the US or in Europe versus when it was produced in Uganda? And how did that, if at all, help inform the way the piece you know, evolved? Yeah, that's the, again, that's, a, that's an important question. Um, uh, so Red Hills is, is an adaptation of another play of uh, a one-man show uh, called Dogs of Rwanda. Mm. that was written by a playwright, an American playwright uh, called uh, Sean, uh, Sean Lewis. So I, I had a, a fantastic opportunity to adapt this play and and so it became Red Hills that was performed in New York in 2019 and in Kampala, wait, in 2018 and in Kampala in 2019. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's, it's really about, um, so the background of the play is the Rwandan genocide in 1994. And it's, it's the play is between two, two um, 36 year olds one Rwandan, the other one American, and um, who meet in 1994. That's their first meeting, and they are both teenagers. And so the play kind of happens now, but we go back to when they meet. Um, so how was it received? First of all, I mean, the genocide in Rwanda in 1994 was such a huge uh, world um, I don't know, tragedy. I, I wish there was such a, a word that, that, that is beyond tragedy um, and something that could have been stopped but was, was not stopped. Um, and so there are so many questions, uh, especially when I think about the Western audience, there are so many questions surrounding like, how could this happen? Um, and so like sharing that story and seeing these two characters who come from totally different worlds, uh, trying to understand these events um, w was really interesting in the sense that um, I think the audience was still at a loss about the fact that this happened and that the world was silent. Um, and and so and they still and so many people still have questions and this is like it cuts across the world whoever got to know about this genocide people still have the questions you know even the victims themselves the survivors still have questions how could this happen and the whole world shuts its eyes and closes its doors on rwanda um now bringing it to home to uganda um i think it was what was interesting for me was one, to see that in terms of the audience, we had more non-Ugandans than Ugandans themselves. And so there was a bit of what I experienced in New York, you know, very similar to what I was experiencing in Uganda. Yeah. Because again, like, I think like 70% of the audience 
was non-Ugandan. Um, so the same questions, you know. Now, when it comes to Ugandans, many of the people who came to see the show are younger, meaning they were born, most of them were born after 1994, or were babies like i remember one of our leads was actually was telling me that he was a baby in 1994. so even as we were doing table work with the actors there was so much that i had to explain we had to do a lot of reading we had to watch so much a lot of videos and 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 some of the films that have been made in relation to the genocide uh so so there was a cross-section of the ugandan audience that was actually learning about these things, you know. They had had, yes, there was a genocide, but like the deep understanding of exactly what happened, of what is going on right now, it was like an, a kind of informative kind of, you know, play. Then we had an audience that, of course, knew about these things. I remember in one of the, um, one of the performances, we had, someone who actually talked about having witness bodies uh, coming through the river because during the 1994 genocide you know like oh i'm sorry i'm going so dark into this no, so there were bodies as 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 tutsis were being slaughtered their bodies were thrown into the river and they would end up in uganda and actually ugandans would pick them up and bury them so in one of the performances we had someone who you know like had witnessed that and and so those are some of the like conversations that we had and of course because this is on our continent we were talking about how do we as Africans stop things like this from ever happening as opposed to always looking to the West to stop them how do we one make sure that they don't happen but should they happen how do we actually be the ones to stop them from happening you know so it was very um, uh, in terms of it being here it, we were really looking at ourselves internally and seeing, you know, seeing how we have failed our brothers and sisters in other parts of the continent. And when these things are at our doorsteps, how other people also fail us. But then what do we need to do to stop these horrible, horrible events from happening? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, Kofi Annan, of, I often think of what Kofi Annan said when he was, you know, a, a member of the UN, I mean, Secretary General at the time, saying that it was his biggest failure in his position yeah. to not have stopped this genocide. Yeah. So, um, the fact yeah. that, you know, having visited Rwanda as well and in conversation with you and our colleagues in, in Rwanda as well, it's still such a, a heavy topic, right? And, and rightly so, because I don't think the trauma and the, the, um, politics behind it have fully been worked out yet so it really does bring up a lot right it does um, it does go ahead were you going to say something i don't know whether i should say it anymore, but yeah, no i was gonna say that it does and i think it it brings to the forefront our the complication of of these arbitrary borders the complication of um, of colonialism, the complication of you know divide and rule that that you know that some of these colonialists, some or all, all, all of them <laughs> introduced to 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 us, you know, uh, and and you know the like when I think about like the Germans and the Belgians who first took hold of, of Rwanda and how are that, how they, you know, like completely separated Hutus from Tutsis and convinced them that they were two different races. And which was like a manifestation of what was happening in Europe at that time, you know? Um, yeah, so these things bring up lots and lots of things that we, as people who live on this continent need to really think deeply about and find solutions to them. How do we move forward with all of this baggage? You know, Simwe, I'm so glad you said that because it's actually the next question that I wanted to ask you. Um, 
an hour is never enough for us to really dive deeper into it. But I, I was hoping we could pivot a little bit about and talk a little bit about your practice as a producer, as a as the producing artistic director of Tebere Arts Foundation, and then also the Kampala International Festival Theatre Festival. Um, how how does this dynamic that you've just spoken about, the colonialism, being able to understand each other as Africans and understand how not to make the mistakes that were made in our history. How does that inform your curatorial choices as a producer um, in both the Kampala International Theatre Festival and then also in some of the other programming you do at Tebere? We do at right. Tebere. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, yeah, we do this together. Don't exclude <laughs> yourself. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so so at the Kampala International Theatre Festival, uh, so the, uh, it should just give a, just a little bit of a background about this festival. So this is a festival that was born out of the work that the Sundance Theatre Program was doing in East Africa. So the theatre program of the Sundance Institute had an initiative in six Eastern African countries. And they, the institute was investing heavily in people, theater makers uh, in, in Burundi, Ethiopia, Kenya, Rwanda, Tanzania, and Uganda. Now, for so many years, the investment was into the playwrights or storytellers who were creating new work for stage. But time came and we started talking about um, for how long can the institute do this? And we started talking about how does it evolve? How do we, as an institute, because at that time I was an employee of the Sundance Institute East Africa, and we're beginning to, to ask ourselves questions of how do we um, let the artists within the region like, take care of, of this investment and continue to, to work, you know, without without feeling like the Sundance Institute has abandoned the kind of work that it, it had supported and the artists that they had supported. So that's how the Kampala International Theatre Festival was, was born. So there was this, whole, this new work that had been created across the, the region in those uh, six uh, countries that I have mentioned. And there was no space for these works to be seen and enjoyed by East African audiences. And I should also mention that for all of the work that we used to do with artists in East Africa, we always consulted with them. So is this, is this something that resonates with the kind of work that you're doing, with the kind of community that you work for, uh, the, whose stories you're sharing with us? And, and so Kampala International Theatre Festival was born out of that. There was, there was, um, there was a strong conviction from the artists themselves that they needed a space where all of the new work they had created could be seen and shared and enjoyed by the audience. So we started this festival and the kind of work that we were supporting as the Sundance Institute was really work that spoke to what was happening in these artists' communities, okay? So, but of course, work that we knew could be accessed by other communities, you know, something that could be produced either by a Ugandan producer or by a French producer, you know. Um, so that, those were some of the things that were very, very important to us. Um, so when KITF was born, the first edition was specifically for Eastern African playwrights. And, and, and then eventually we opened it up to, to the rest of the world and we received submissions from everywhere in the world. Um, and our interest has always been, we want work that speaks to the situations that are happening in the artists', artists communities, but situations that are going to cut across, you know, across ge geographical divide, across uh, class divide, across race divide, um, and projects that are going to spark a conversation, uh, projects that are going to challenge the status quo, projects that are going to challenge taboos. So those are the kind of projects that we are interested in. I mean, because also I know that, you know, art 
for the most part, does not exist in isolation. It speaks to the social, political, and economic landscapes of the communities uh, that these artists uh, create this work. So the, the, the kind of work that we produce at Kampala International Theatre Festival is that kind of work that really probes themes, ideas, asks questions, would spark a conversation, would create a dialogue. And it's all, it has always been a tradition at the KITF that after every performance, we have a dialogue uh, between artists and the audience. And, and so when we uh, started Tebere Arts Foundation, and Tebere Arts Foundation supports artists in Uganda, and hopefully we are also thinking about supporting artists in East Africa who are at different stages in their career. We have an emerging artists program, we have a mid-career and established playwrights program. Um, and we are really interested in, in storytellers who are talking about things that are very, that, that, that people would feel comfortable to talk about. We, we, we go there. We support projects that really go there, even for the emerging artists who really want to find their individual artistic voice. Those are the kind of artists that, that we support, that, that don't want to continue doing things as, as usual that want to tell stories that, uh, that you know, speak truth to power, that want to tell stories that, that investigate taboos, that want to tell stories um, that, that, you know, that probably the public would cringe at, yeah. That's a tall order. I mean, it sounds like, I mean, it, it, we're in our seventh edition now, which is very exciting. And this year it's, it's great because we get to do an archival, you know, um, a nostalgic video uh, that we will be sharing during our week of KITF. Um, but that's a tall order. Um, how do you go about achieving all of this? What is the, what is the vision plan? What are the challenges? What, is the, um, what are the struggles with, with trying to create that kind of space that engages artists in dialogues, but then really speaks to East African audiences and the East African, and, and Africa, I think, African experiences? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, you know, it's interesting you said that. I didn't know it, how it was a tall order. <laughs> it's a tall order. <laughs> well, I don't know if anyone can do the arts in East Africa, in our region, without, you know, doing the kind of things that I, I have just explained. I, I, yeah, and I know colleagues who are doing like some kind of similar work. I think because this is who we are, this is our environment. So it never feels like it's at all order. It's what we do because this is where we live. And these are the stories that our artists are telling. So, and we've got to find ways of supporting these stories uh, so that they can be heard and they can be seen, not only by East Africans or Africans, but also by the rest of the world. Um, so yes, there are challenges, absolutely a zillion. <laughs> <laughs> I think we need a whole other series to talk about those. I, I am telling you, you're absolutely right. Yeah, I mean, I could speak for hours about the challenges mm. that we face. Mm. I think the main one, like, because we encourage stories that, that break boundaries, mm. we, we've always been weary of someone stomping KITF and shutting down the festival. Thankfully, it has never happened. Hey, 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 hey. <laughs> and we, we hope it doesn't. We hope it doesn't. Yeah, yeah. We, I, I, I'm really, really grateful for that, that this is our seventh year and we've never had an experience where we are being told you can never do this festival again. Mm. Um, sure so like there's always, yeah. 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 It's always that fear that, you know, what if this is the year that something like that will happen? Yeah. And, and so we always have to think carefully, how do we cover our bases? Um, and now, especially now, that recently there was a bill uh, in our parliament, in the Ugandan parliament, that 
uh, I don't even know what to say, that really stifles us as artists. So in future, for me to, or for us, you know, to, to invite productions for the KITF, whoever we invite, we have to first um, take those, those applications and submissions to the Uganda Communications Commission for their approval. And then they have been very um, kind of hidden uh, taxes that we have to pay for, for, the, for like to put up a festival. If say I, I'm producing my own play, I also there are some fees that I have to pay. So, there's, so there are things that have been introduced to kind of stifle creativity, stifle freedom of expression through years. Um, and these are coming through like laws and regulations, through, um, through internet taxes, through, through fees, just like fees. And, and so and as, as artists, we, we, don't, we don't make money. We don't have a whole lot of money at Kampala International Theater Fest. Yes, we do charge, you know, audiences to pay a small fee, but it's not, it's not a, like a money-making venture. So those restrictions actually are very challenging for us you know our festival is like 90 over 90 percent funded by you know different organizations and so we are not yet at a stage where we are able to actually like uh, make money from ticket sales and so for us to have to say get money off of what we have already budgeted for the festival to pay for I don't know what, uh, is, is very challenging. And, and also to know that if, say, I submitted a script that I think would uh, resonate with our audience that is very strong, that, you know, like has all of the themes that, that we are excited about as, as, the, as the festival staff, and then for, say, the Ugandan Communication Commission to say, no, we don't want this production. So, I mean, it's, um, yeah, there are, there are really many, many challenges, um, but, but mainly censorship. So Asimwe, how do you navigate these challenges within the festival and then also trying to cultivate, whilst also trying to cultivate the next generation of artists? I mean, you mentioned that we work with emerging artists, right? And we have a residential lab, we have a lot of other programs that really focus on mentorship of the next generation of, of, of Ugandan, East African, African theater makers. So how do you, what is the, what is the in-between? Is there ever going to be an in-between, you feel, um, for, for a cultural revolution of sorts? Dare I say, hopefully nobody's, mm, I, yeah. Yeah, I mean, how do I navigate this? I, I honestly, I also don't know. I don't know. I see one, I see a festival happening and, um, and with like limited funding and we are able to do so much and I, I'm like, wow, that happened. But I should mention that I think having a core team that is extremely sold out to the vision that we have is very helpful. So you were talking about me having a baby. Like last year, I wasn't even there for KITF. I was busy having my baby. And I, but I, ha I knew that I had a team in place that was going to carry forward the kind of vision that, that we have as a festival. So I think having a core team that believes in, in my vision and in the vision that we started with as the Sundance together with Bayimba, um, having that core team and knowing that they are fully sold out to the kind of work that we do is extremely important. And I think the other thing is to, to always find ways of, you know, like navigating what's happening in the political space uh, and know that, okay, if I put this production on, what are the chances that the, the people who are um, involved in it are going to be arrested or not? And, and so like just keeping our ears on the ground is very important. We know what's happening. Um, and of course, I mean, we, 
one of the things I remember, for example, when I was doing Cooking Oil, Cooking Oil is a, a very political play. One of the things that I remember we were talking about was if we have like an international team on the, on the production, it always kind of helps a bit because these uh, fragile democracies or repressive regimes tend not to look bad internationally. Yeah. So, it's sort of so soft, uh, cultural diplomacy thing that goes on. Yeah. 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 So also KITF being an international theater festival, I think is kind of helpful because we bring artists from different parts of the world. So, um, and I, I guess also, yeah, let me finish that thought. So I think that also kind of cushions us a little bit. And also I think KITF hasn't, you know, theater doesn't attract huge audiences, like for example, uh, music, you know? So I, I'm imagining that if say we were, eight, were to have like 10,000 people at a festival, it would probably be an issue and we would like be bringing attention to us and you know like the establishment would begin to ask hmm, what's happening there <laughs> you know uh so so yeah so yeah so but in terms of like is there going to be any in between i really think like Eastern Africa generally, we have such a young population. And I think our young population is so done. Like they are so tired, you know? Yeah, they are so tired. They want to be able to express themselves. They want to be on their own terms, you know? They don't want people to be telling them, you cannot say this, you can say this, you cannot be this, pers this kind of person, you can only be this kind of person, you know? Young people are so ready to be who they want to be, to say what they want to say, and to do all of these things on their own terms. My hope and prayer is that even as we age, us, the adults. <laughs> yeah, you don't, don't even age. You don't even, like, you tell me I'm 13 all the time, but Asimo, you're like 20 <laughs> all the time. <laughs> you're so <laughs> kind. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so that we don't then become these kinds of people that have been, like, running our countries for a thousand years. <laughs> for, you know, uh, mm -hmm. that's my hope that really, like, what we are doing is something that we will continue doing and that will create a space for yeah. self-expression, for freedom of speech, and, and, and for young people to truly like take on these leadership positions. I'm very passionate about men mentoring young people, really passionate, because I think that that's what makes, like in the area of the arts, that's, that's what makes art continue to thrive. And, and that's, what, um, that's what allows people, to, uh, young people to really uh, self-define who they are. Right, right. That's such an uplifting and inspiring note, I think, for us to end on. Just this idea that, you know, we are in service to ourselves as artists, but also to this future generation that will bring about the change that these repressive regimes need and haven't seen in, so, in such a long time. Um, yeah. So, Asimwe, from the bottom of my heart, on a personal and also for all our, our viewers, on a personal note, want to say thank you. Thank you for being uh, the person that champ has championed this sort of new age of work, and uh, not only through your own practice as a playwright, but also what I find so generous about you is that as, you're, as a producer, you create this space for all of us to thrive as well. Um, so it's not only about you and your work, but it's about how does that work fit into this larger ecosystem that you're a part of championing and you're a part of building. So, you know, it's because of people like you, I believe, that, that young people like myself and other people of the future generations will look back and go, this is the reason and this is the reason change happened. So thank you so much for everything you've shared with us and for everything you continue to do. Thank you so, so much, Karishma. You're making me tear up, <laughs> you know? <laughs>
I don't mean you're to really, tear up on Diwali. You're really making me tear up. No, I am so, so thankful that I have been able to have this conversation with you. And I am so thankful um, for all of the support that I have received as an artist myself, uh, the mentors that have been in my life for so many years. And um, yeah, I, I don't want to start mentioning names because that will be another hour. <laughs> And I am really also thankful for all of the artists that have gone through Tebere at Foundation Doors and for the artists that apply to the Kampala International Theatre Festival and, you know, bring their work here. We don't offer so much to them, but they, they really like make the time, make the journeys, our international artists to come to Kampala, our Ugandan artists who have been really our ambassadors to their work year in year out thank you so so much for making me the kind of person that i am thank you so much asimwe that was beautiful um how can we follow you how can we follow your work just as we as we sign off today oh, okay so i am um, <laughs> i'm laughing because lately my facebook account has been all about my baby <laughs> I don't, know. I don't know if people will find anything useful <laughs> in terms of my own work. Um, the future. <laughs> this is the thing I wake um, up to every morning, what, seeing <laughs> peanut, our Peanuts photograph. But anyway, go on. Yeah. So I am on Facebook and my, my Facebook name is Asimwe Debra Gashuji and Gashuji is G-K-A-S-H-U-G-I. And I'm also on Twitter, um, and my handle is at addicdax, A-D-K-D-A-K-S. And, and my website is Asimwe Debra Kawe, K-A-W-E. Thank you so much, Asimwe. Thank you. And just to shout, like, notice our matching. That did not happen. Um, we did not plan it. It was so coincidental. So <laughs> talk about the aligning of the energies. But uh, th <laughs> thank you so much for spending this time with me on Diwali and uh, for entertaining our viewers and for sharing your story. And uh, folks that have been, that, have, that are logged in, if you are interested in connecting at all with the work, please, please do, do reach out. Um, from next week, what we're going to be doing is introducing a component to our series where you're able to ask questions live. Um, so for the purposes of this, because it is a recorded session, feel free to reach out to me on my HowlRound platform if you do have any questions um, and we can be sure to forward them to Asimwe or myself and, and, get, them, and get them answered for you as soon as possible. Um, so thank you everybody for tuning in. Have a wonderful Monday afternoon, morning, evening, um, and hope that the new year or Diwali brings up a, um, a positive light in your life. Thanks everyone. Thank you, Asimwe. Bye. Thank you, Karishma.